welcome to the Jet Setter Show, where we explore lifestyle-friendly destinations worldwide. Enjoy and learn from a variety of experts on topics ranging from upscale travel at wholesale prices to retiring overseas, to global real estate and business opportunities, to tax havens and expatriate opportunities. You'll get great ideas on unique cultures, causes, and cruise vacations. Whether you're wealthy or just want to live a wealthy lifestyle, The Jet Setter Show is for you. Here's your host, Jason Hartman. Welcome to The Jet Setter Show. This is Jason Hartman, your host, where we explore lifestyle-friendly destinations worldwide. I think you'll enjoy the interview we have for you today, and we will be back with that in less than 60 seconds here on The Jet Setter Show. Now you can get Jason's Creating Wealth in Today's Economy Home Study Course. All the knowledge and education revealed in a nine-hour day of the Creating Wealth Boot Camp, created in a home study course for you to dive into at your convenience. For more details, go to jasonhartman.com. It's my pleasure to welcome Kathleen Petticord back to the show. She is the publisher of Live and Invest Overseas and the author of How to Buy Real Estate Overseas. And she just has a wealth of information about the world, literally, of real estate investing and living overseas. Kathleen, welcome. How are you? I'm very good. Thank you very much for inviting me back. Good, good. Well, it's a pleasure to have you back. And you're coming to us from Panama City, Panama today, right? I am. Yep. Fantastic. Well, tell us a little bit about your new book. The focus is, as, as the name uh, suggests, how to buy real estate overseas. And the big idea behind the book, really, it can be boiled down to a, a single word, diversification. And that's the, the driving I- idea behind the whole idea of buying real estate overseas right now, because I think that in the current global climate, that diversification is key, and not in the traditional conventional sense only of diversifying assets. Everyone knows that you don't want all your eggs in one proverbial basket when it comes to investing. But but the idea here goes beyond that to diversifying your life, uh, your lifestyle, your future, your, your whole – everything about – how you're living, what you're doing, your future, your family's future, your legacy, and on and on is all wrapped up in this. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, Kathleen, I've been so fascinated by this topic, having traveled extensively. I'm up to 65 countries now, looking at real estate, actually with some of your affiliates in Panama, Argentina, et cetera. And one of the things I really struggle with when it comes to overseas investing is is that it seems like in so many of these countries, unlike the U.S., you have you have very little middle class. And granted, the middle class is totally under attack in the United States, in my opinion. But, you know, we still have a pretty big middle class here in the States. And and, and when when you look at real estate investing, I want to invest for cash flow. Sure, appreciation, capital gains, speculation is great when it happens, but it's not super reliable. It, It seems like in a lot of these countries, there's really not much of a renter class. So when you're investing, maybe buy a home for retirement, a second home, that type of thing. But on the pure investment side, I want cash flow. I want income. And I think a lot of investors feel that way. I I would agree entirely. And and in fact, a big section of the book is given over to this idea because, as you say, there are really two ways to make money from investing in real estate, capital appreciation and then cash flow through rental income or yield. And in in the current climate, there aren't a lot of markets where you can have some reasonable expectation of capital appreciation. There just aren't. Last decade, mid last decade, everyone thought that all property markets all around the world would only ever go up. All markets were expanding. And so people thought, you know, you could buy almost anything anywhere and be feel really sure that two, three years from now, it'd be worth a whole lot more. Than we we, we have a word for that. We have a phrase for that. It's called the greater fool theory. <laughs> and it doesn't work. <laughs> exactly. It doesn't and usually end well. it doesn't hold up. Yeah. It doesn't hold up. And we've seen how badly that can turn out in a lot of markets where that, the greater fool theory is a great way to describe, for example, what happened in Ireland to take one market. That's exactly what happened there. The Irish just kept selling and reselling and reselling to themselves, their own 
land and property and and that completely fell apart and the Irish economy and property market have they've collapsed this, and Ireland's not the only place where this has happened it's happened in a number of markets that are now in all out crisis and then many other markets have have seen slides have seen devaluations they aren't in outright crisis but they've certainly the values have fallen by substantial margins over the past 5 or 6 years but that is not the everywhere that is not the case everywhere while capital appreciation is not an agenda right now, and we've seen that that doesn't always hold up, and in some cases it can completely fall apart, and I would say that's not a realistic agenda, investment agenda right now, but not all markets at the same time are contracting, and you made the point that in much of the world, there's not the kind of middle class that there is in the United States. There's not that kind of, of segment of the population. That's very true, but that's also not it nece- that doesn't necessarily mean that th- that there are no markets to invest in for cash flow. For, right, right. And, you know, I, I would just liken the middle class to the renter class. That's exactly. What, that's what I'm saying. In a lot of these countries, you're, you're not going to rent to the locals. I mean, their standard of living is low. Their income is terrible. So then you're left with maybe some expats, tourists, or vacation rentals. And-, and that's the market, I think, that makes most sense in a number of places, is the tourist rental market. There are some some parts of the world, Puerto Vallarta, Mexico, is, a, is an example of a place with a very proven track record for tourist rentals. Paris, France is the world's most proven track record for tourist rentals. It has the, the biggest tourist market in the world. It's the most touristed city in the world. And those people all need a place to sleep. There aren't enough beds for the tourists that come to uh, Paris every year. So there's a strong, there's such a track record there and a continuing to expand market. So that's one important idea for cash flow. The other is that while you're completely right to say that in most markets there isn't the middle class that we know in the United States, there are a couple of important exceptions to this. And two that I would highlight would be Panama City and Medi in Colombia. These are two markets where there are ex- fast expanding middle classes. And so you also have a tourist market. It's not the kind of tourist market you have in Paris, for example, not that, that volume. But there's a, there's a steady tourist market in those two cities. And there is as well a local rental market because there are expanding middle classes. And, and so what, talking about tourist market for a moment, so what you, what you mean there is rentals for two and three nights at a time or a week at a time? Or a month at a time. Right, short-term rentals, uh-huh. and exactly that's a distinction to make when considering where to invest for cash flow. Do you want to invest uh, to buy a property that would go into the short-term market, which is going to be the tourist, the resort market, or the long-term market? And there are pluses and minuses uh, in both. Either way you go. And so when when it comes to the property management aspect, when you're in the tourist market, I mean in the states, typically for vacation rentals, they charge about fifty percent. Of the rental, of course, the rental income's higher because people pay a lot more by the night or by the week than they do by the month. But you know, on a one-year lease, how developed is the property management infrastructure? How ethical and honest is it, and transparent is it, Uh, and that kind of stuff? Exactly. It's wouldn't in Paris. Certainly, it's very developed. It, I would say it's more developed than than in the United States, and uh, it would be very easy. I own an apartment in Paris that I that I rent out, and I have a property rental manager I've worked with for five years now, very successfully, and and she's been great, and uh, and she's very reliable, and I trust her, and she's done a great job keeping the place rented. But th- right, that's not always the case. And Paris would be at one extreme, and then a, v- a very developing, unregulated, emerging market in Central America would be the other extreme, where right, finding someone you could count on to take care of your property, to report properly and and reliably on rentals, and to make sure that you netted everything you could, and that that net actually ended up in your pocket. That that would be harder than in a developed market like Paris. But you mentioned the cost of all of this. Another one thing I will mention is that it's nowhere near 50%. I would say that in, well, say in Panama City, for example, which I think is a good market to look at for rentals. And here you could do short-term, mid-term, or long-term rentals. There are, there's a market in each case. And your total cost of property and rental management would be something around 20 to 30%. And what kind of overall income can you look at annually? In foreign markets, they usually quote it in rental yields. In the U.S., people like to just think of RV ratio, meaning if the property is $100,000, what's the monthly income? I say ideally it should be at least 1% of that value. But your thoughts there? It, it would be very different market to market in different parts of the world. When we were living in Ireland, this was some years ago, 
the rental returns were negligible. They were 1% or less in some cases, and that was because values had, had inflated, had, a, had become so inflated. So people were, if someone was buying a property for a million dollars or a million euros at the, uh, in this case, the, the rental yield was 1% or less. And it was not uncommon in, in the key markets that, va- that prices were that high, were that big as round numbers. You know, you couldn't buy anything in Dublin for less than a half million euros, even up, up to five or six years ago. So that, that would be one extreme. Then at another extreme, I would say would be Medi in Colombia right now, where values are, are a bargain on a global scale. So you can buy something very rentable for $100,000, and then you could look at a return, a net return of 10 to 12%. Yeah, okay. So that's pretty good. And when you look at the long-term rentals, how does the property management work there? We, we talked about the vacation or tourist rental. And it would it works in the same way in that you'd need both in, in many markets you need a property manager and a rental manager. They aren't necessarily the same person and they, they fill different functions. So the property manager is the one who makes sure that your property is maintained, that repairs are taken care of, maintenance is done, and that your bills are paid, you know, your electric bill and your phone bill, things like that then the rental manager is responsible for actually keeping the place rented for find you know doing the advertising finding you tenants greeting them and checking them in uh, dealing with the, the actual tenant side of it whereas the property manager deals with the property side of it that would be one way to to look at it and uh, again the total cost between those two people in some cases they could be the same agency you might find an agency in uh, Panama City for example that could fill those both of those functions or you might end up working with two different people or two different agencies but the total cost would be about the same I'd say look for 20 to 30 percent and is everything pretty much that you're looking at and recommending is it is, is it pretty much all condos or do you have single family detached homes? You do, but less common and they come with more carrying cost and hassle. You know, because a house has more maintenance and more repairs and it it might have a yard and, you know, a, a lot more to to deal with as an owner. And long distance, which as a long distance landlord, long distance owner, one thing to remember is is the hassle factor. And so you want to keep things as turnkey as possible. And that's why when you're doing this long distance, investing in a rental overseas, a condo or an, an apartment, the more turnkey, the better, really can be the better choice. What about the condo associations, though, and the dues? I mean, when when I look at stuff in the States for our investor clients, I don't really like condos very much because those associations are just, you know, number one, they're corrupt a lot of times. Number two, yeah. they're skimming so much money off the top and the dues are high. And, and, and this problem won't be true overseas so much because the lending environment is very different. But in the States... These homeowners associations, when they're in condos, now I don't mind homeowners associations so much in with single family homes, where they'll have a very small dues and keep your your neighbor in a single family neighborhood from repairing their car on the lawn and that kind of stuff. Some of these neighborhoods get a little iffy. And what what happens is, Kathleen, the HOA will get into litigation. Either an unhappy residence will sue the HOA, or the HOA will sue the developer over construction defects. And the U- U.S. is obviously the most litigious place on the planet. And that's one reason you want to consider investing overseas, by the way. But when that happens, the the banks will stop lending inside these HOAs. And when there's no financing, there are, the buyers dry up and the values plummet. And it's a real problem. It's a vicious circle. Can you address that at all? Yeah, HOAs are. You're, you're right. They're, they are. They can be a problem. They they can create and or present a lot of risks, but not the kind of risks you're describing. Especially the last one you described. I think that would be a very U.S. specific problem. Maybe you'd find that in the U.K. too, because uh, there are a lot of similarities I'd say between those two markets in that regard. But in the rest of the world, the uh, right, there aren't the lending industry, uh, industries locally, first of all. To begin with, they don't exist. So that's, that whole factor it just isn't there. But you do have still a lot of concerns with HOAs, and that's why I, I make the point, and I talk about this in the book as well, when you're buying a rental overseas, you're buying not only the unit, but you're buying the building. So you have to do your due diligence into the building. The biggest problem, frankly, with HOAs outside the United States is owners not paying their dues because the, these organizations are much less structured, much less formal, and they are much less regulated or, or 
visible than in the United States. And so it's not uncommon. It, we own rentals in a number of countries, including here in Panama City. And we're my husband and I are on the board of the HOA for the building where we own an apartment rental here in Panama City. And so we see this from, from the inside there, and it's not uncommon that it, for a building here in Panama City, to use this as an example, where you could have half the owners or more not paying their HOA fees. Well, that's a big problem for obvious reasons. Then the building can be left with just not enough money to take care of itself, not enough, you know, not enough money to keep the elevators running, for example. And so th that's the biggest concern outside the United States, I would say. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. So when when we kind of led into that with part of the HOA issue relating to financing issue, talk to us about financing. I mean, is it basically cash everywhere now? I know that in Belize, I was there about a month ago speaking at an offshore investing conference, and I know that in Belize there's some financing options now. I think Panama, you're going to say, probably has some financing options, but elsewhere, maybe not. I don't know. Exactly. Europe, yes. In, in, in Europe, it's in most countries it's possible as a foreigner to borrow to buy the terms aren't going to be what an american is typically used to so you're not going to get a 90 or 100 percent loan to value usually the best you'll get will be 80 percent you're not going to get a 25 30 year mortgage that you are looking at 10 15 20 years that's typically. not terrible, though. I mean, one of the things I love about U.S. real estate, Kathleen, is that ever since the Great Depression, it's been subsidized by the government through Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. And we, we have, without a doubt, the most exceptional lending environment here and the most debt-friendly asset class. But what you're talking about with overseas real estate really is, is better than I exactly. thought it would be. Now, now, what are the rates, though? Well, well, right. In Europe right now, they're very low. The the thing is that you're not going to get a fixed rate of interest, but but current rates in Europe might be, in France for example, it might be three percent. But the so again they're not they're not. We'll talk about uh, Central America in a minute, and there you're looking at double digit interest rates typically. But in Europe they can be very low. The the thing is they're not fixed. You just won't find a fixed rate of interest. So there's that risk. Now, having said that, in it's been a long time since, even though interest rates are variable, since they've varied up, if you see the point. They, they've been low for a long time. Right, right. Because now, mostly adjustable then, rate loans have declined recently. Exactly. But, but I don't exactly. think that's going to be the future, by the way. So. Well, and then back in, in Central America, as I said, here uh, you're looking at double-digit interest rates. 15 16% isn't uncommon. And here, even probably less uh, loan to value. So here, 50% in Belize, for example, as you say, you can borrow there. But the but I know one bank, for example, that does lend readily to foreign buyers. The most they'll lend is, is 50%, and their interest rates are going to be 12%. I think. Yeah, that's 12 not, or 13%. that's not too desirable at all. What about in Colombia? Did you mention that? In Colombia, there is no. It's going to be very hard as a foreigner to to borrow, to buy. In Colombia, it's very hard even as a foreigner to open a bank account. So the it, there isn't the a developed or very competitive or sophisticated banking or lending industry for non-nationals, non-residents. Which, which, by the way, leads me to another question. A, a lot of people nowadays, especially, are very interested, and I don't know if you cover this at all, but sometimes it ties in with real estate investment. They're interested in getting dual citizenship and having a second passport, having kind of an escape hatch, if you will, you just never know what'll happen and if right. if you might need that someday do do any countries offer that you want to recommend like an economic sort of real estate investing related passport opportunity that you know of they do at uh, many countries just i guess to take a step back it's possible to acquire second passport and and citizenship in many countries the one uh, option for that is through residency. So it, by being a foreign resident for X number of years and going through the process, it's possible then to acquire citizenship as well. And But then... But it's well, not quick. <laughs> it's not quick, exactly. And so that's the trade-off. Either it's, it's either it takes a long time or it's going to be expensive because there are a number of places that offer what could be refer is referred to as economic citizenship or in or investment for citizenship. For example, St. Kitts is a country that has a current economic citizenship program based on real estate investment. 
but the cost there is somewhere around two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Yeah, I, I heard like two fifty to four hundred thousand. It's pretty yeah, expensive. Yeah, yeah, and but again, it's it's quick. It's a quicker route, but it's but that that wouldn't be within everyone's budget. Yeah, yeah, definitely not. A lot of a lot of the reason people are looking for these overseas opportunities is to cut costs and you know, especially in retirement and just have a nice retirement and low cost of living. Do you want to address you know any of the crisis markets where the buying opportunities are real good? You may have a alluded to that already in our discussion. I did a little bit, but I would say, again, I did mention uh, Ireland, which is a a market in in all-out crisis that may be near the bottom. It's I don't know. It's you know, it's hard to say, but many people are calling this year uh, into 2014 maybe the bottom of that decline that has been steady over the past six years. What really. what, what cities and in Ireland? I would say you well, you want to stick with the tourist cities because here for rental that would be I think the the market to go after would be the tourist market, and so around Kerry, the Ring of Kerry, uh, Galway would be a great choice. That's on the west coast, and then Dublin, of course. But Dublin's going to be the most expensive place to buy. Right. Okay. Go ahead. Another other crisis market. Uh, another crisis market would be Spain. Here, it the it's it's simple overbuilding. Spain was unbelievably, ridiculously overbuilt uh, last decade, and and then the buyers just stopped showing up. The buyers in this market mostly were British. The coast of Spain was was developed and and uh, populated then by British in search of some sunshine, but that market has dried up and. Meantime, Spain, the developers along the coast, were were building vast numbers of uh, of units, condo units, in anticipation of a never-ending flow of British buyers, and then that flow stopped abruptly. And the this coast is so overbuilt. I think that there's still a considerable way further down in Spain because there is just so much inventory. And so while there is probably opportunity in Spain, I think you have to be very careful about where you buy because there is just so much inventory. But if you if you had time to look and to buy in a good location, in a good building, there there definitely are, are tremendous bargains to be had. Yeah, yeah, and you're not worried about the collapse of Spain and civil unrest with, with unemployment, I think, at like 27%. Yeah, it's just ridiculous. Exactly. It's very, it's yeah. very high. Someone asked me earlier today, as a, someone wrote into a reader to say, do you, wh- where do you expect bloody unrest? Not did I expect it or was that a it's possibility, where. but where? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> where did I see that? So, I mean, it, you know, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not, really a doom and gloomer, but I guess it's not completely outside the realm of of possibility. There are a lot of places around the world where things are very bad and people are struggling. Yeah, no question about it. I I didn't want to sidetrack you with that too much, but Kathleen, it it seems that most of your work, and maybe it's because of the where the opportunities are, most of your writings and thinking is is centered, and I may well be wrong in this, it's just an impression, around Central and South America rather than Europe. I know you've certainly, and we just talked about some European countries, and you've certainly talked about Romania before and various countries in Europe, but is there a reason for that, or is my impression wrong? Yeah, you're completely right, and there is a reason. It's because Central America, well, it's because my readership is primarily in the United States. My reader is is mostly an American, and so if I take the American perspective and look at the globe from that point of view, well, the part of the world that's nearest, easiest to get to, and that is at the same time can be cheap and sunny is Central America, and and cheap and sunny are the two things that that a that get people's attention in the first place. So why would someone want to be doing this in the first place, either living, retiring, or investing in a piece of real estate in another country? Well, the two driving factors are because it's cheaper than in the United States, but there's a cost opportunity, and the weather's better. I mean, bottom line, it comes down most times to those two things. And so if you look at the world from that point of view, where is it cheap and sunny, and also if you're an American, easy to get to, well, that leads you to Central America. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, makes sense. What else do you want people to know? Uh, yeah, well, you know, here's a question for you. I always ask a question and compound it with another one. I apologize. <laughs> it's a bad habit. <laughs> no problem. But, but you know, <laughs> what about buying? I mean, there's this sort of romantic idea of buying a little farm in a foreign country. 
having an agricultural investment or another type of investment, you know, rather than a condo. Are, are there any other sort of property types that are, are of interest? Yeah, that's a, that is a great question because that's something we haven't talked about. And that, I think, is the other big idea, maybe even a bigger idea right now, which is to invest in agricultural or productive land. It's the other way to look for cash flow. And as you, you pointed out as we started our conversation, cash flow is really the thing to be shopping for right now as an investor. And so you can earn that from a rental yield, but you can earn, also earn that from a crop yield. And two markets that I think make a lot of sense in this regard right now are Brazil and Uruguay. I think that a piece of farmland, a little farm in Uruguay, is one of the smartest things an investor could buy today. And I highlight Uruguay uh, because it has so much farmland. It's a country with so much really fertile, productive land. And where the government has has approached this very formally and created an index to rate land in different parts of the country, farmland in different parts of the country, and it amounts to a kind of MLS, multiple listing service, for farmland. And, and as you know, the multiple listing service is unique to the United States for the most part. It exists in pockets elsewhere in the rest of the world, but for the most part, you don't find that. But in Uruguay, they've created something that's specifically focused on farmland, and so you can go down there shopping for a, for a farm, or, and you can combine this. One, another reason I like this, you can combine this again with a lifestyle agenda. You could shop for a productive piece of land, and you could use the government's index to, you know, to understand exactly what you're buying. They'll tell you, depending on where in the country you're looking, how fertile the land is, what kind of crops would grow best there, what your yield could be expected to be. You can find all this. It's published online for free, all this data. And then as well, okay, so you target... Do you want to give out a website for that, by buy. the way? I, 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 you know what? I'm going to see or, if or, I can or find some it search in my terms. book real quick. Just maybe some search terms. Search, but for yeah. farmland, search for farmland in Uruguay, and you'll find that online. But, and so, but then go searching, depending on what you want to grow and what kind of yield you want, and find a little farmhouse. What could be more charming for a retirement home than a little finca, a little hacienda in Uruguay? And so buy it today. Say you're eight years away, ten years away from retirement. Buy that today. Farm it. Lease it out to a farmer. If, you know, I'm not suggesting that everyone has to go pick up a, a hoe, but lease it out to a local farmer, someone who knows what he's doing, or a farm management company, which exists. Again, they're very formalized in Uruguay. You'll earn some yield every year along the way, and then when you're ready, you could go live in the in the little house yourself in retirement. Fantastic. And and you you talked about the MLS, and that's one of the concerns I always have, Kathleen. As I've looked about at real estate around the world, the U.S. market is highly developed. It's a mature industry, and I'm not talking about the the investment itself necessarily. I'm talking about the industry of real estate sales. And as such, you're not so concerned that you're going to overpay, at least not dramatically. You can make mistakes in the U.S., obviously, but but you've got Zillow, Trulia, the MLS system. Agents are licensed, whereas elsewhere, they don't have a license. They just say, hey, I'm, in, I'm a realtor. You know, or, exactly. Uh, exactly. I'm, I'm a real estate agent, I should say, to use the proper terminology. What do you do to make sure you don't overpay? They have these off-plan developments, and maybe you want to define what that means, too. It's sort of a funny phrase. That... Well, oh, yeah, off-plan is what it is used in uh, Europe and the UK to, re- pre- uh, to refer to what we might, what might make more sense to us as pre-construction. So off-plan is buying pre-construction, buying before something is built. And in that case, you should pay a healthy discount to what values are expected to be when the the project is completed because you're right, you're taking on a risk. You don't know for sure that the project will be completed as intended or promised or according to the timeline promised. And And for an investor, of course, that makes a big difference. When does your return start? And if they don't finish until 18 months after they said they were going to finish, well, that's 18 months you're without a return that you were counting on. So you want you should pay a big discount to buy pre-construction or off plan. That's one point. And that, then your bigger picture question is how do you know what to pay in the first place? Because as you say, without an MLS, you can't run comps. You can't say you can't ever say or go to someone and ask what should something cost. You can in the United States, as you just said, you can find out what a two-bedroom, 1,500 square foot house in a certain neighborhood in a certain city should cost within a reasonable margin. In the rest of the world, that's all but impossible. 
And so what that means is it's you've got to work with as many different real estate agents as possible, and that's really the only way to combat this. It, it definitely puts the burden on the buyer, and it means that you can't just work with one agent. You can't find one agent you like and develop a rapport and a relationship and then count on them because even if they are well-intended, and for the most part, frankly, in emerging markets, they're not. As you said, they're not professionals. They're not licensed. They're just some guy in in many cases, I don't want to overstate this, but it's the reality. In many cases, they woke up one day and thought, hey, I think I could make a lot of money selling real estate to other gringos. And they do. And, you know, no one stops them. No one even pays attention to them. So, so you have to be on your guard. You have to understand that that element definitely exists in a lot of the emerging markets where you might be shopping. And so you definitely cannot work with only one agent. You need to work with as many as possible. This is true even in markets where you might not expect it, like Ireland. When we arrived in Ireland 15 years ago and started shopping for a house, we were so confused because the agent we went to, we described the house he wanted, and he told us he had one. And, and I'm not exaggerating. This isn't a joke. And we thought, what are you talking about? How do you have one house? We had, he had one house on his books that fit the description we gave him. And then we went, finally, it dawned on us, well, let's talk to another agent. And then we found that the other agent had three, which were different than the one the first guy had. Well, then we finally realized we had, at that point, our experience much more focused in Latin America and Central America, where we took this for granted. But coming to Ireland, we thought this was going to be a market more like in the United States, but it's it's not at all. The, the U.S. is indeed a unique market place. Yeah, yeah, it really is in, in that way. It's it's very interesting. There are very few people in your world of specialty that have the kind of knowledge you do. Kathleen, give out your website, if you would. And I, I just downloaded the book on Amazon as the Kindle edition, but any resources you want to mention would be great. Oh, well, thank you. It's, so the website is liveandinvestoverseas.com, and that's all one word, no hyphens or periods, liveandinvestoverseas.com. And the, the best getting started resource for all of this in general is the e-letter that I write. So I have the book that just came out, uh, How to Buy Real Estate Overseas, and that's available in bookstores and on Amazon, and that focuses on the best places to think about investing in real estate right now. It talks about all these ideas we've talked about, buying for yield, buying productive land, crisis markets. But then there, you know, there are a lot of other ideas that go beyond real estate specifically to do with living, retiring, spending time around the world in other capacities. And to, to just start to get your feet wet or start to consider these ideas, I would recommend signing up for my e-letter, which is free. I write it personally from wherever I am in the world each day. It comes out every day. And it, again, it's the best getting started resource because it talks about not only real estate, but lifestyle and retirement. It covers the whole world, and it's free. And if you're on the website, on the homepage, there's a little box where you enter your email address, and then you'll start to receive it. And when you're tired of receiving it, you just unsubscribe. Two final questions for you real quickly, just a, just a brief answer, if you would. I know, I know you've got to run, but what should people know about moving money around the world? That's a big one, but maybe just a, yeah. Yeah, just a quickie it, on that. that would be a, great. Exactly. Uh, and there's a chapter in my book on that. Uh, I, I spent a whole chapter on it because there are a number of issues here that the, that the typical investor isn't going to be prepared for just because he hasn't encountered them before. By typical investor, I mean a U.S. investor whose experience is investing in the United States. When you start dealing with having to move money a across borders, then new issues arise. You have currency exchange issues. Sometimes you have foreign exchange controls to and restrictions to remember. In Brazil and Colombia, just to uh, name two countries, two markets that are, make a lot of sense for investment right now, there are also markets that impose some foreign currency uh, controls. And so it's not that that's not a reason not to invest in those markets, but it's something you want to understand before you invest because it's, it's a matter of paperwork, frankly. But you need to get the paperwork right if you, if you want to be able to take your capital and your profits out of the country when you decide you want to do that. Otherwise, you could have a problem. Yeah. So there, there are a number of, of issues that you, you do need to be prepared for. It's not 
rocket science, it's a process. It, it really comes down to uh, paperwork in most cases and fees, understanding the fees of sending a wire, for example, or accepting money into you know, your bank account here and there. There are going to be fees and you want them to be as, as little as possible. Yeah, absolutely. And you got to collect fees back from your property manager for your rental income from your tenants. Exactly. So, uh, exactly. so there are some issues there. So that's in the book. That's good. And then the last question is, and of course, this is a big subject. I know it's probably in the book as well, but making sure that you really get tight to the property you buy. I mean, I'm sure there are many, many stories of people who plunked down a couple hundred thousand dollars and then didn't really get the property they thought they were getting and just lost their money and got completely ripped off. Yeah, uh, unfortunately it happens. And, you know, over all these years, I've been doing this for a a long time now. I've heard lots of, of horror stories. And my recommendation here is you need to, before you do anything, find an attorney who speaks English, who has experience with foreign buyers, who has as much experience as possible helping foreign investors in his country. You, you want to interview three or four attorneys before choosing one because your attorney is your ally, your most important resource in the country, and he's the one, he or she is the one, who should be able to help you navigate any local concerns or issues to do with history of ownership and and title. And in some markets, there are particular concerns that you want to be aware of before you start shopping. And these, I do address these in the book country by country because they're country specific. In Mexico, there's ajito land. In Nicaragua, there's cooperativa land. In Panama, there's rights of possession. And in Europe, there can be title issues as well. This isn't uh, only in Latin America. And then there are restrictions on foreign ownership throughout most of Asia. Again, something you want to be aware of before you buy something that you before you know you find out well in fact foreigners can't own this even though some developer or real estate agent might be happy to sell it to you and then you discover too late that as a foreigner you in fact can't hold ownership. So there are caveats and most of them are market specific and this is where you really have to rely on your attorney. So again, that's that's where to start. Yeah, yeah, very good point and make sure you check your attorney out. Make sure they're legit and they're not a crook too. Yeah, so Exactly. And yeah, that goes and that, that's real... the same in the US by the way. <laughs> yeah, and one real quick point there I'd like to make is your attorney should be your attorney, not your developer's attorney and not your real estate agent's attorney. You go to buy from a developer in, say, Nicaragua. It could be anywhere. And the developer, you'll get to know him, you'll feel comfortable with him, and you'll be ready to buy. And he'll say, oh, well, just use my attorney. That'll be easier. He knows the project. He knows the contract. That's the last thing you want to do. You don't want to use the developer's attorney because there's such an obvious conflict of interest. Who's he really working for? So you want, to, you want an independent attorney. Great point. Well, Kathleen Petticord, thank you so much for joining us today. You just have a wealth of information. It's always great to have you on the show. Thank you so much for having me back. It's great to talk to you as always. This show is produced by the Hartman Media Company, all rights reserved. For distribution or publication rights and media interviews, please visit www hartmanmedia.com or email media at hartmanmedia.com. Nothing on this show should be considered specific personal or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, or business professional for individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own and the host is acting on behalf of Platinum Properties Investor Network, Inc. exclusively.